Welcome to my channel. We've already taken a look at the development, defenses, and some of the buildings at Stirling Castle. Today we're going to look at the palace itself. Although parts of the castle date back to the 13th century, the palace inside the walls was built in the 1540s. It was commissioned by James V. Part of James's motivation was to impress his new French wife, Marie de Guise, and also to provide an appropriate stage setting and home for his family, including his daughter, Mary, who would become Queen of Scots. A bigger inspiration might have been James's need to demonstrate to the entire world his wealth, education, sophistication, and power. Let's take a look today at this Renaissance palace, probably the most famous in all of England, here on The Armchair Traveler. Although imperfect, this model gives you an idea of the floor plan of the palace. The blue arrow points you to the palace itself. Notice there is a walkway overlooking the garden area and marked with an orange arrow called the Prince's Walk. The palace was designed with wings around an open court marked with a red arrow and called the Lion's Den. The building to the right with the triangular roof line is the Great Hall. We can begin with just a bit of history about the monarchs most responsible for the development and decoration of this palace. This unsigned portrait of the two of them, James V, and his second wife, Marie of Guise, gives you some idea of what they must have looked like in life. They planned on appearing much bigger than life in this palace. This wasn't the first residential area for the lord, the lady, their family, and their retainers. The original palace, you'll recall from a previous video blog, which they now call the King's Old Building, was a residential complex started by James's father, James IV. Construction of this new palace, which we'll visit today, began in 1504 as a gift for his new wife. The palace is one of the best preserved Renaissance buildings in the United Kingdom and has been refurbished to look like it might have looked in the 1540s. The exterior decorations, including the Prince's Walk, are all still there. The design styles you'll see included elements of English, French, German, and even Dutch construction. This James was a part of that Tudor family. Henry VIII was his uncle. Henry caused constant trouble, not just in London, but everywhere. You will see a great deal of decorative carved stone and carved wood. Luxurious interiors furnished more in the French style, complete with newly developed tapestries and more. The aim of James V and his queen was to present themselves as wealthy sovereigns, not just with knowledge of the outside world, but immense good taste. The palace you see here was divided into two separate apartments, each with three rooms called the King's Apartment and the Queen's Apartment. They surrounded an open courtyard called the Lion's Den. Each apartment included three major rooms with the status of visitors allowed and the luxuriousness of the decorations increasing as you move closer to the bedchambers. There was an outer hall, sometimes called the guards hall, an inner hall, sometimes called the presence chamber, and the formal bedchambers, which were connecting but actually separate. To be honest, I really wasn't dazzled by the exterior view of the palace building, perhaps because I had seen the gold-colored great hall first. The view was interesting, but was overwhelmed by that larger building. How wrong I was! On the left is a view of one face of the palace as seen from the inner courtyard. The enlargement gives you a glimpse of the heavily carved detail that James had incorporated into the structure, along with the weathered stone, which truly doesn't stand out today because it's lost all of its paint and gilt. When it was built was another matter altogether. Notice that false roof line? That is a feature adopted from Dutch construction styles. 
The Prince's Tower and Walk look down over some gardens and, and when you look up give you a view of some of the figures and gargoyles applied onto the facade of the building. Among the exterior features, and since they were all carved in stone they've all survived, is a likeness of James V himself. He seems to be looking over his creation with satisfaction. Perhaps in homage to earlier times, there are also some gruesome monsters on the exterior of the palace, including a winged devil. The best guess is the figures originally were painted and probably gilded, although that has long ago washed away in the harsh Scottish weather. In the 1500s, when James was building his palace, his architect designed it with wings surrounding an open courtyard to maximize light in the rooms as well as to provide for cross ventilation. The story goes that he named this area the Lion's Den, perhaps because he actually kept a live lion here. European kings sometimes sent lions to one another as gifts. We know that James V's grandfather, Henry VII Tudor, had given a live lion to his wife, Elizabeth of York, as a present. Earlier Scottish kings had possessed them as well, including David II and James III, each of whom had one, while the last of the Jameses, James VI, who was to become King of England when Elizabeth I died, had three. The lions show up in decorations all over the palace. There's even a carved head depicting Hercules wrestling with a lion. If James V actually possessed one, he might have used it for a model for the carving. These two images come from the Atlas Obscura. Although somewhat sparsely furnished today, the outer hall had huge leaded glass windows, complete with shutters, a decorative wooden ceiling, and a tapestry of James V's coat of arms. There was also a huge fireplace, complete with an iron fireback, which would have warmed the room some in the winter, and additional tapestries almost certainly would have helped insulate the place, possibly along with rushes on the floor. No amount of decoration, however, could conceal or eliminate the weather. Far more luxurious and highly decorated than as now, the inner hall or presence chamber is where the king would meet and greet, hobnob with his fellow nobles, conduct business, and generally hang out when he wasn't asleep or out and about. Notice that the ceiling of this chamber is far more elaborate than the previous room and features replicas of the 37 sterling heads that James ordered carved for his enjoyment and amusement. We'll talk about them more later in the walk. The bedchamber was the most elaborately decorated of the three rooms in the king's apartments, although it's lightly furnished today. Despite the name of bedchamber, this was still a public room. The royals were able to retreat into smaller, more comfortable, and easier to heat lodgings at night. If you look closely, you'll see another iron fireback on the back side of this fireplace. These heated up and reflected heat back into the room. The unicorn above the fireplace was a symbol of unity and strength. Carved ceiling decorations here are far more elaborate than the other chambers. The decorations suspended from the ceiling are called bosses and identify the four orders of chivalry to which James V belonged. The Order of the Garter, the Order of the Thistle, the Order of the Golden Fleece, and the Order of St. Michael. We're ready to move on to the Queen's apartment. The design here mirrored that of the king's apartment and included an outer hall, shown here, an inner hall, and a bedchamber. James built this palace not just to impress the world with his wealth, power, and sophistication, but also to impress his second wife, Marie of Guise. The marriage contract specified that in the event the king predeceased her, an unlikely possibility, she would retain title to the castle, among many other things. Marie was no ordinary woman. She was proven tough. James's first wife had died of consumption. She was tough in an age when childbirth also carried off many women. She was a widow. She had managed to survive her first husband. She was also the first of 12 children her parents had produced, and she herself had produced a son during that short first marriage. Since women always got the blame when a girl popped out, this record was an excellent recommendation. Marie did not disappoint. She gave James two sons. The older was James, Duke of Rothesse, who was the heir, and a spare named Robert. If the name Duke of Rothesse rings a very tiny bell, you might, you might have followed the courting of now King Charles of his first wife, Lady Diana Spencer. One of his titles was Duke of Rothesse. 
The heir and the younger brother died one day apart in infancy in April 1541. A double blow like that would have gutted most moderns. I know it would have gutted me, but James and Marie knew the drill. Another child was a necessity. The third and last child of the union turned out to be a daughter, Mary, who was born on the 8th of December, 1542, and is known to us as Mary, Queen of Scots. Marie of Guise was left behind with an infant and a regent. Later on, she became regent in her own right. She would have needed a room befitting her status, not just as queen consort or dowager queen, but queen in everything except name when she was Mary's regent. The queen's inner hall comes completely decorated from the time of Marie's daughter, Queen Mary, not her mother, with the obligatory fireplace, tapestries, paintings, and thrones. Notice the wood paneling next to the windows, which forms closable shutters. The big tip-off that these are modern reproductions doesn't come from the design or even the bright color. Bright colors were the rule of the time, and the design came straight out of tapestries from that time period, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. The tip-off is that there was no damage. Formal or public rooms like this one don't tell us much about how people lived in these castles. I don't think it was very comfortable. This room does give us a couple of clues, however. One thing that you cannot see in the picture, it's hidden by the lady in the pink coat, was that the room was furnished with a chamber pot which was stored under the bed. The room was heavily curtained, there are shutters, and there were golf clubs next to the bed, also just behind the lady with the pink coat. The image on the right shows Mary, Queen of Scots, playing golf at St. Andrews. It's from the Illustrated London News, but it was published more than two centuries after her death, so we can't take it as definitive proof she knew how to play. Golf wasn't always respected and was considered by some as a time-wasting, expensive nuisance. James V's great-grandfather, James II, had an act of parliament back in 1457, which actually banned both golf and football. The act is the earliest known written evidence of the game in Scotland. With a weak monarchy, powerful nobles, and a constant threat of invasion, military training was compulsory for all males over the age of 12. However, instead of practicing archery, ordinary people preferred to spend their leisure time playing golf and football. The ban was renewed and removed several times, suggesting that once golfing took hold, it never ended. Ghostly hauntings are a common feature in medieval castles. Stirling Castle is said to have seen several. One of them was the Green Lady. There are several different tales about her origin, but the one I read suggests she was a maid of Mary, Queen of Scots. Apparently she or someone thought she was also a fortune teller. People think that the ghost is a harbinger of doom. Dressed in green velvet, to look into her eyes is mean certain death. She was said to be highly superstitious and convinced that a terrible fate would befall Mary on the night of September 13, 1561. This would have been a dangerous thing for anyone to predict. Back in England, 20 years earlier, Elizabeth Barton was executed by Henry VIII as a result of her prophecies against the marriage of Henry and Anne Boleyn. Nevertheless, the tale continues, the maid stayed awake that night and, when the fire broke out, carried the queen to safety. The queen was saved, but the maid died from her wounds. The story has a kernel of historical fact behind it. We have records showing that a fire occurred on that date, but there's no evidence that night of the girl or a maid or the foretelling of her own or the queen's death. Her tragic ghost is said, even so, to haunt the cat, bitter spirit who brings misery and doom to those unlucky enough to find themselves in her company. Perhaps she's annoyed that nobody believed her. I was surprised I couldn't find a painting showing this rather startling and romantic image, and what you see above from Creative Commons was the best I could come up with. One of the grandest features of the castle is the collection of sterling heads. You saw a bit of them in the king's presence chamber. They decorated the palace ceilings until they collapsed in 1777, after which they were dispersed. They include kings, queens, nobles, Roman emperors, characters from the Bible, classical mythology, and even the king's jester. All of the heads were hand-carved based on the surviving originals, except for two. The paint jobs are speculative. After more than 500 years, with part of the time in storage, all of the original paint has long disappeared. 
The head of Marie de Guise was one of the two heads lost in the fire of 1940. The other was Henry VIII, who was James V's uncle. Although the original disappeared, we can thank Jane Graham, who was the wife of the deputy governor of the castle, and who was interested enough in the heads that she sketched them when they were still attached to the ceiling. This is the recreation of Henry VIII's head, complete with a lion over his shoulders. It was lost along with that of Marie de Guise in the 1940 fire. Here you can see two versions of the replica, one painted, decorated, and installed in the presence chamber, and one just carved. An immense amount of work must have gone into these recreations, in part because they did not have an original to copy. They had to do it from a drawing. Normally I enjoy the painted versions better than the plain, but in this case I prefer the plainer version because it gives a better idea of all the artwork that must have gone into the original carving. Here we see the court jester depicted clutching one buttock and sticking out his tongue. He obviously had just gotten a kick from someone, most likely the king. The image is thought to have been a warning to the visitors to watch their tongues or to risk receiving that kick. Thank you for joining me on our visit to the Palace of Stirling Castle. Check back next time for another adventure here on the Armchair Traveler.